to talk to you, Ian. Uh, you've uh, had many celebrated roles in your, in your life, uh, initially as a uh, English literature academic, then as a psychiatrist, researcher in neuroscience. More recently, you're best known for your books and, and, and as a philosopher, really. And I wondered which of these uh, very different roles is closest to your heart and w which has given you most satisfaction? So, uh, of course, philosophy never has an ultimate answer, but it doesn't make the, the, the quest pointless. And, and I've enjoyed it enormously. What I've been able to do, I think, is to bring a philosophical mind to bear on neuroscience in a way which I hope is productive and creative. But um, yes, I, I got into the literary studies by accident, actually. What happened was that um, I wanted to go to Oxford and you had to sit and examine a school subject, but philosophy wasn't one of them. So um, I sat it in English. And I went for an um, interview, and they said, what do you want to read? And I said, philosophy and theology. Partly because um, PPE, which, as you know, is philosophy, politics, and economics, didn't particularly grab me, because that's the aspect of philosophy I'm not really interested in. Whereas a kind of philosophy that at least has room for theology in it, and a kind of theology that has an interest in philosophy it seemed perfect. But it wasn't an honours degree, and so my, my interviewer said, you can't do a non-honours degree, you've got to come and do an honours degree, so why don't you just do English? You're clearly kind of interested in it and okay at it. So I ended up doing that. Right, that's all, all very fascinating. I mean, I, I did PPE myself, and right. then became a philosopher, so you know, that, that's <laughs> a, you know, interesting, that, that, yes, that, that yes. parallel. So I was going to ask you, but I think in a way you've answered that. Uh, the question is whether you're the neuroscience and uh, your research is there, the science had led to your philosophy, or whether philosophy has led to the science or influence. But I think you've answered that and say, actually, it was your philosophical approach which has driven your neuroscience work. You're right in that in my 20s, I wrote a, a, a sort of philosophical book about the way in which we approach works of art called Against Criticism. And um, what I felt I was trying to explain was something to do with the mind-body problem. That we took these embodied beings, works of art, and turned them into disembodied abstractions. And that this was running in the opposite direction to the way the work of art itself led you. And it, in doing so, they lost all their implicit meaning and they lost their uniqueness. It all became explicit and dull, like explaining a joke. So I thought, there's something wrong here. And, uh, I, you know, for all the mind-body philosophy seminars I went to, nobody really approached the thing in a properly embodied way. And I thought the only way to do this is to become a doctor and actually see what happens to real people when something goes wrong with their brain and it affects their whole sense of being or something happens in their psychological world and it affects their body and that, that's what I did so I, I became a doctor. Mm. And uh, you obviously in your, in your, you've had two major major works, uh, your first uh, Master in his put forward a completely new account of the brain yes. and more recently matter of things of course uh, explores the nature of reality consciousness uh, and the divine yes and um, I, I, I wonder whether uh, in the light especially of what you have just said whether you really see yourself as a religious thinker a difficult one in an apophatic way I would say I don't see myself as a non-religious thinker yes. <laughs> in other words, I don't, I'm not one of these people who has no time for, no interest in, and no room for whatever it is that people have timelessly explored, which is this sense of something that goes beyond the immediate and the, the rationally explicable. And um, so I, I'm, it's interesting because a lot of philosophical colleagues said, don't, don't include a chapter on the sacred in your book, because everyone will go, oh no, he's a faith head, you don't listen to him. Um, and I've been waiting for flack from atheistic people. I haven't got any at all. The only flack I've got has been from rather down the, the middle Christians who've written to me saying there's a sort of Christ-shaped hole in your account. Why do you not talk about it? And there are two reasons for that. One is that I wanted to be inclusive, not exclusive. I wanted anyone who had any inklings of anything divine or sacred to be able to be welcomed in and not have this thing, we're Christians here, 
so you better sign up to eight impossible things before breakfast. Um, and, and the other thing really is that um, I, I, I don't really myself feel entirely certain what I think about Christianity. What I can say is that it seems to me to have quite possibly the most um, rich mythos about the nature of the relationship between humans and the sacred that there is. Um, whether I believe certain things are literally the case seems to me almost irrelevant. Mm, that's interesting. So uh, I think that maybe good uh, leads on to something I'd like to ask you about, which is is uh, your understanding of truth. I think it's probably fair to say that you and I share a um, criticism of mm. uh, reductionism and uh, so forth uh, and materialism mm. in, in science. But we both see how important science is and yeah. see that you and I have to pursue it. But maybe there's an area where we have a, a rather different approach, which would be in that I think that while you are often wishing to point to the our inability to actually access truth, I feel quite a lot of the time you're wanting to say there is a truth and that we should try and, and get to it. Is that fair? Absolutely fair. Um, I think there's a distinction to be made between something that's just out there and we need to go fast as we can and get it mm. and something that is always going to be a matter of greater or lesser approximation. So I don't hold that there is a truth that somebody one day will hold and say, this is the truth. But I believe that we should be and are compelled, drawn by our, um, our minds, our imagination, our intellect towards um, wondering which of these various things that people believe is truer than the others. Mm. Uh, and do you think then there's uh, any tension between on the one hand pointing in a way to our inability to access truth and at the same time trying to be telling people uh, what you think, think the truth is? Or is there, is there some sort of tension in that? Well, there would be if I thought that I was telling people what the absolute truth is. But uh, I think I'd like to distinguish between certain areas of life. So, uh, for example, in science, um, I believe that there are certain findings, let's take it no further than that, there are findings that are very hard to contest. In other words, a, a, a review of an enormous number of subjects seems to show that this is truer than that. And, and that's fine. Um, and, and that's the kind of truth that in part one of my new book, The Matter With Things, which is devoted to neurology and, and, and neuropsychology, is, is to show that certain things about the brain are assertable up to a point. I mean, science is always an approximate thing. Um, one way of looking at science is it's the perpetual history of mistake and beliefs, because, of course, they're always replaced in time. But it's nonetheless, there is grounds for saying that. When you come to, you know, what is the nature of the cosmos and, and so on, we're in an area where certainties are fewer and, and empirical tests are rarer. So what we're really talking about is a way of looking at the world, at the cosmos, at a human life, that makes more sense than any of the other alternatives. So it's an interesting way you put it, makes more sense, um, avoiding uh, somehow saying that it's uncovered. What, what is the case? No, I think it has uncovered. Right. But it's that this is always a process, that, one that is never completed. So it's perfectly respectable to be a seeker after truth. I think it's rather disreputable to say, I have found the truth. And, and of course, the fact that we can't be certain doesn't mean that everything's up for grabs and that um, in a postmodern way, anything that you want to say is true. I don't believe that. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, I was going to call my new book, um, the, um, not the matter with things, but there are no things. And somebody pointed out to me that that might align me with a certain postmodern school, which basically says that whatever it is that we think is something we just make up ourselves. Yes. I, I don't believe that. I also don't believe in a kind of naive realism that there's just stuff out there in some way that a lot of scientists seem to believe, and it's just our job, like 
Geiger counters, photographic plates or whatever to pick up the data. And one of the puzzles there, isn't it, is that if you, if you don't buy the naive realism story about the world, you are in this sort of interregnum type space of wanting to say things, but at the same time having a caveat that it, it, this shouldn't be taken as definitive in, in some yes. way. And do you think that where when we're doing that, saying, uh, you know, take it like this, but this isn't definitive, that 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 itself is a is a, like a, a new form of definitiveness that you're saying, well, this is how it really is. Um, that yeah. we can't we can't really grasp the ultimate, and we're just in this in this space of trying to point to something. Do, do you think do you think there is a puzzle there or not? I don't think it's a puzzle in that there's no alternative to it. I think yeah. that as a philosopher. Um, you're not going to say, but I don't really believe this, because in that case, why did you just bore us with saying it? Why don't you say what you do believe? So we all say what we believe to be the case, but belief is inherently approximate. We are fallible beings. Our experience is not universal. But is that claim, belief is inherently approximate? That sounds like a definitive account <laughs> that belief is inherently proximate. Well, I, I, there, there is a word game like this which goes, um, the only thing that's um, certain is that those who believe that there's anything certain are wrong. Yes. And, and that, that would be the succinct way of putting what you're pointing to. And to an extent that there are paradoxes like this sentence is untrue. Um, you, you, um, you have to accept that. But I think that you and I probably know that there's a quite a difference between a certain kind of dogmatic kind of philosophy in which one thinks simply this is, you know, ad advancing the sum of whatever it is we know in a, in a reliable and a uh, way that is never going to be revised or repeated, and a view that whatever it is that we understand is to some extent provisional, but that we don't have the choice in this life to be completely certain. We only have the choice to do what seems to us better. So in your, in your account of the brain, you have the, the uh, essentially a notion of two uh, different ways of attention, left brain attention, right brain attention. Yes. Do you see your own theory as a product of your left and right brain? I certainly do. Um, and I don't think that I'd be better off, or anyone would be better off, if they had a left hemispherectomy. Um, it has its role. My only... The problem is that it tends, because it knows literally less than the right hemisphere, that it thinks it knows everything. And um, that's dangerous because it rules out a whole other way of seeing the world or understanding the world, which is more subtle, harder to articulate, but I think more important and foundational. So I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to make judgments and say this is better than that. But that just doesn't entail me in being somehow mistaken because I've, I've made a certainty out of anything, I don't think. Mm. And, and do you think, therefore, the risks that you point to in the way that left brain goes yes. out, about things, do you think that you are at the same risk? You know, is there, are we all at risk Potentially of this we all are. left brain? And, and how do you deal with that internally for yourself? You know, is there a bit of you, it's a bit of Ian that says, actually, I need to be a bit careful about that left brain no, stuff? No, no, uh, 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 that's not how it works, as I imagine you, you, you would uh, believe anyway. Uh, uh, no, what it is, is that I suppose over a lifetime of pondering on, on many philosophical questions, I've seen that there are discrepancies between different points of view, and people have said, well, this school thought this, and this school thought that, and you know, take your pick. Um, but I've always felt that um, there were unarticulated truths, that were unarticulated partly because they're very difficult to put into language, but are nonetheless important for that. And so, I learned early on to be attentive to implicit meaning, to um, the idea that there weren't these hard and fast certainties. And in doing that, I think my, or maybe I, I don't like to have put a chain of causation here in something which is probably circular in nature, um, that, that something arose in me which was a point of view towards the world, which was that of the right hemisphere. And 
uh, it's not that I disrespect the left hemisphere. I only disrespect it when it comes to me and claims that it's the master and knows everything, because it doesn't. So um, you were just saying, uh, Ian, that, that um, you didn't see yourself as needing a, a left brainectomy, as it were. And uh, I, I guess the, the reason why you felt you want to say that is because it is, of course, the case that um, uh, sometimes you, you give the impression that you know the left brain is the baddie, you know, yes. that, that we need to be guard against this yes. left brain, and somehow the right brain is yes. is, is, is it's got everything good on its side. Yes. And do, do you do, do you think that's how it is? I mean, do we, should we be suspicious of the right brain as well, as it were? Is is there something about the right brain that makes it actually? less threatening than the left brain? It, it, it behoves us to be sceptical always, yeah. but not sceptical to the point of paralysis. We should be sceptical of our own scepticism as well. But um, effectively, yes, the left brain is not in any sense a baddie until it's, and this is the crucial point, until it decides that it knows it all and it, it can run the show. And it's so deficient in knowledge compared with the right hemisphere. I mean, a sound bite I often use, but can easily defend and have done at great length, is that the left hemisphere helps us apprehend the world, i.e. grasp onto the world and get it. But the right hemisphere helps us comprehend the world, which means holding it together. And that is a quite different faculty. And in part one of the matter with things, which is the neuropsychology, I work through nine possible or eight possible portals for knowledge information of the world to come in and I show that in all but one of these the right hemisphere is demonstrably more reliable um, and so in that sense we need to be more worried about what the left hemisphere is telling us because without the contribution of the right hemisphere it becomes frankly delusional. I'm not using that in some loose metaphorical way. It actually does become prey to delusions, hallucinations and things that we would all accept are unreal. And I'm not the only person to have pointed this out by any manner of means. So to that extent, it behoves us to be more suspicious of what we can see comes from the left hemisphere's attempt to, to tackle something than the right. But as I said at the outset, it behoves us always to be sceptical. Indeed. Well, look, uh, in a, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Delight having you here. Thank you very much. It's been lovely being here and talking to you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.